Good evening and welcome to tonight's PACET webinar. Tonight we will be talking about CompTIA's A plus exam 220-801, the first half of the A plus certification. And tonight we will be talking about objectives 2.1 and 2.2. As I said before, good evening. My name is Brian Farrell. I am the instructor and certificate mentor for the PACET program that's called titled P&I Technology and Integration Support. And I am also the instructor for CIS 205 for Edmonds Community College. So you're kind of wondering what are objectives 2.1 and 2.2 of the 220-801 exam? Well, objective 2.1 is identifying types of cables and connectors, and objective 2.2 is how to categorize uh, those cables that you just identified. And with that, Let's go ahead and jump into objective 2.1, identifying types of cables and connectors. And we're going to start by talking about fiber optic cables. Now, the cable themselves are composed of one or more strands of fibers very high that are very high quality glass or plastic. The strands are coated with a sheath that aids in the transmission of the light signal down the fiber. That sheath actually allows that light signal to bounce down the fiber from one end to the other. Now, fiber optic cables have three main types. There's actually four, so I'm going to add that fourth one here in just a moment. But there is the SC, the square connector or subscriber connector. It's easily identified by the square form of the tip. Then there is the straight tip. Now, <clears throat> this one's also called the stick and twist. It looks kind of like a bayonet Neil Kelselman connector or BNC connector. You stick it in and then you twist it to lock it in place. And the third type is the LC, or the loosened connector or little connector. And it's fairly similar to the SC, but smaller in size. The other one that you should know is that the MTRJ, the Mechanical Transfer Registered Jack. Now, when you look at an MTRJ, it always comes with the two fibers kind of bonded together. The others may actually come as individual wires. So now, each connector, when you're <clears throat> working with fiber optic cabling in your local area network, or even in most um, wide area network applications, it's actually a pair of cables that are connected. This allows for duplex, com duplex communication. One cable is used to receive a signal. The other cable is used to send a signal. So they always come in pairs. Well, most of the cases, they come in pairs. So now let's move on to coaxial cabling. Now, <clears throat> Excuse me. A coaxial network cable is composed of a central conductor, which may be made out of a solid copper wire, or it may be stranded copper, or it may be a steel wire that's been copper coated. It's surrounded by an insulating layer, which is surrounded by either a metal mesh or foil layer which is finally surrounded by an insulating layer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the, end of, the ends of a coaxial network cable are required to be terminated. What that does is when an electric, electrical signal travels down the cable, 
When it reaches the end, if it's not properly terminated, what happens is it will bounce back down the cable, causing issues with networks transmissions. So you need to properly, you need to make sure that the ends are properly terminated. Now with modern equipment, most of it has the terminator built right into the coaxial cable. Now the most common types of coax that you're going to find in today's networks are the RG6 and the RG59 coaxial cable. The RG6 is the coaxial cable that's used by um, cable companies and telecoms that have cable networks uh, to run the cable into your house. And quite often, it's the cable that actually goes into the back of the cable modem. Now, the RG59 <clears throat> is used to connect uh, electric electronic components that use coaxial for communication that are fairly close together. And the reason for that is the signal degrades really fast with an RG59 cable. They have to be close together. Now let's talk about the least common uh, connector that you'll find for a coaxial cable, and that would be the BNC. That's the Bayonet Neal Councilman Connector. It's also called a Bayonet Nut Connector, and I've also heard it called the British Naval Connector. This is an older technology, and you're not really going to see it on the modern network. And what you do is it's kind of like that stick and stick and twist connector that I talked about with fiber. You stick it in and then it's kind of a, has a spring-loaded lock. So when you twist it, you kind of push in and twist that engages the spring. The spring tension keeps the lock in place. Nowadays, a more common connector is the F connector. And that's the one that's pictured here. And that's just a um, it's a bayonet style connector, but you don't twist it to lock it in place. You can actually just push it in place in some applications, or the end is threaded and you can thread it into place and in case you're concerned about it being able to be pulled out. So now let's talk about twisted pair. Now a twisted pair is the most common of all networking cables. The cable itself is composed of eight wires that are twisted together in pairs, which is, of course, why it's called twisted pair. The twist rate of each pair is slightly different, and that's done so that uh, it reduces the chance for interference between pairs. That's called crosstalk. Uh, and some of the pairs, in either in some cases, the pairs themselves are all four pair may have a metal or foil shield surrounding them, and that would make it a shielded twisted pair. Now, all of the pairs are contained within an outer insulating sheath. Now, the common connectors for your twisted pair network cable or the RJ45, that is the registered jack 45. Now the registered jack, excuse me, now the RJ45 is the network connector that most people are common with. Why? Because it's the one that is used in Ethernet networks, and we all pretty much use Ethernet networks nowadays. Now the RJ45 is also, can also be called a modular 8P 8C connector. That would be an 8-pin, eight 8-conductor eight connector. That's actually the more formal name for the RJ45. The other one that's common in networking, and a lot of the times we don't think about it as being in networking, is the RJ11, the registered Jack 11. The reason we don't think about it in networking is because it's the one that plugs into your telephone wall jack and into your telephone. Now this one too has a more formal name and that would be a 6P4C. That's a six pin four conductor connector. And it, you can use the 
RJ11 with either one pair of wires if you have a single line phone or if you have a multi-line phone quite often it will use two pairs or four wires. So let's talk about the twisted pair cable a little bit more and the first thing that we need to talk about are the wiring standards. There are two different twisted wire pinout standards and they are associated with the TIA EIA that's the Telecommunication Industry Association Electronic Industries Alliance and those pinouts specify the ordering of the wires that are in RJ45 the the T uh, the T568A standard calls for pin 1 to be white green and then you go green, white, orange, blue, white, blue, orange, white, brown, brown. The other standard is the T568B. And pin one is white, orange, followed by orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, white, brown, brown. Now, out of the two standards, the more the more common of the two is the T568B. So it's more prevalent in networking today and just remember that's white orange orange white green blue white blue green white brown brown there are some tools that you need to become familiar with if you're going to be working with twisted pair wiring and the first one is is the wire stripper wire strippers now these are used to remove the insulating jacket from the outside of the cable not from the pairs themselves in most cases Quite often, wire strippers are actually part of the crimping tool. Now, the crimping tool is what is used to secure the ends of the wires into the modular connectors, into the RJ45. Then you need to know about the punch-down tools. Now, those punch-down tools are used to secure the wires into a punch-down block. Now, and that would be like a 110 block which are often found on the backs of patch panels. Now your punch down tool, if it's any good, will actually not only install the wire into the punch down block, but it will trim any excess wire. That actually keeps things kind of neat and tidy and eases installation. The last tool that you need to be become familiar with is the cable tester. Now, cable testers are used to test the integrity of the network cable. It will tell you if there are opens or shorts, and a lot of times, depending upon how much money you spend, of course, your cable tester can also tell you which standard you are using. So that about covers it for Objective 2.1. So now let's move on to objective 2.2, which is categorizing cabling. We're going to talk about coaxial cabling specification. Now, coaxial cabling is broken out into different categories based on its physical characteristics, such as the size of the conductor and the size of the composition of the insulating layer and also its impedance value. That impedance value is what determines what type of terminator is on the end. Now the specifications are actually taken from the radio guide, the radio guide tables, the RG tables. Now the RG tables were actually a specification developed by the US military. They no longer use it, but we do. So now let's talk about some common, or maybe not quite so common anymore, coax standards. The first one is, is the RG58 cable. Now, <coughs> excuse me, it was used for up to 10 megabits per second networking at a distance of up to 185 meters. It had an impedance value of 50 ohms. So that standard, the 10 megabits per second, up to 185 meters was actually called 10 base 2 networking. 10 referring to the megabits per second, base standing for baseband, and the 2 standing for 200. Kind of a trick there because it only goes up to 185 meters. Then there's RG8. 
it was also used for 10 base of the up to 10 megabits per second networking, but it had a distance limitation of 500 meters. So it was 10 base 5 networking. And it also had an impedance value of 50 ohms. Then there's RG11, which was also used for 10 base 5 networking. So guess what? 10 megabits per second, 500 meters distance limitation. Also at 50 ohms. Then we have RG6. RG6 is used for cable television or Brad, uh, Brad, broadband uh, carry, carrying the broadband networking. The distance that it can span varies. Why? Well, because it all depends upon how much signal you're pushing down the cable. And it has an impedance value of 75 ohms. Now, I really don't talk about RG59 uh, because you really don't need to know about it because it's usually used for uh, smaller electronic components, not really in networking, but you might find a question about it on the exam. I highly doubt it. By the way, if you're using a network that still has RG58 or RG8 or RG11, I would highly recommend that you upgrade or update your network. You are seriously behind the times. So now let's move on to coaxial fiber. Now fiber optic cables are classified by their type of transmission. They are going to be either multi-mode fiber or single-mode fiber. Now multi-mode fiber or MMF uses an LED so a light emitting diode as its method of transmitting light down the cable. Now single mode fiber uses a laser diode as the method of transmitting the light down the cable. Now if you think about it, multi-mode fiber probably can't go as far because it's only using an LED, whereas single mode fiber, which uses the laser diode, can span a longer distance. That laser diode has more light power than the LED. Uh, cable, or cable, fiber optic cabling is further subclassified based on the size of the core and the thickness of the cladding, which are both measured in micrometers. There are some common subclassifications specifically with multi-mode fiber, and the most common ones are the 50 micrometer cladding, or core, excuse me, 50 micrometer core with 125 micrometer cladding, followed by the 62.5 by 125, and then there's the 85 by 125, and finally, we have the 100 micrometer core with the 140 micrometer cladding. Now, single mode fiber typically has a core size that varies between 8 and 10.5 micrometers, and the most common cladding used with single mode fiber is 125. So now let's, <coughs> excuse me, now let's talk about the difference between uh, multi-mode fiber and single-mode fiber. So with multi-mode fiber, it uses an infrared LED system to transfer, transmit the, the light signal down the cable. I've already said that. I'm going to probably repeat it again. Now, it can use multiple rays of light, so it can send more than one signal down the path. Because it uses the LED, uh, an LED system to transmit the light signal, it's used for shorter runs of fiber. The runs actually, I think, that the runs are actually under 200 kilometers. In some cases, depending upon the standard, it will actually be a shorter distance than that. Now, the most common common 
of multi-mode fiber cabling used. Uh, actually has a core size of 62.5 with that 125 micrometer cladding. And it has a maximum distance of 275 meters. Now, single mode fiber is a little bit different. Now, it uses that laser diode arrangement to transmit the light signal down the down the cable. And even though I show the, the light path as being single, you know, straight in line, it actually bounces down the cable kind of like it did on multi-mode fiber, but it's only a single ray of light. Now, it's used for longer runs. Uh, when I created this presentation a couple of months ago, uh, at that point in time, the, the farthest distance that it could span was up to 40 kilometers, but I just read something the other day where they've actually gotten some single-mode fiber cabling to traverse 70 kilometers. That's a long ways. So now let's talk about some of the standards. And we're going to start with 1000 base SX. That's one gigabits per networking on multi-mode fiber, and it can span up to 500 meters. Then there's 1000 base LX. That's one gigabits per second networking on single mode fiber up to five kilometers. Then we have 10G base SR. That's 10 gigabits SR. And that's on multi-mode fiber up to 300 meters, and that has a local area network connector on the end of it. Then we have 10 base, 10 G base SW. That's 10 gigabits per second networking on multi-mode fiber. Again, up to 300 meters. But guess what? On in this situation, you use a wide area network connector on the end of it. Then we have 10 G base LW. That's 10 gigabits per second networking on single mode fiber, and it can span up to 10 kilometers, and it has a local area network connector on the end of it. And then we have 10 G base LW, 10 gigabits per second networking on single mode fiber, also spanning up to 10 kilometers, but this time we have a wide area network connector. Then we have 10G base ER, that's 10 gigabits per second networking on single mode fiber, and it spans up to 40 kilometers, and it also has a local area network connector on the end of it. I find it kind of strange that you can go 40 kilometers and still want to have a local area network connector. I guess you might have some money, some serious money to spend at that point in time, but hey, if you want to do it, Go for it. And last, we have 10 G base EW, which is 10 gigabits per second networking on single mode fiber up to 40 kilometers in distance over a wide area network connector. Now, something I want to point out is if you have an S in the standard, as in SX, SR, SW, that S stands for short distance. That's multi-mode fiber. Now, if you have an L, as in LX, LR, LW, that stands for long distance. That's single-mode fiber. And finally, if you have an E, as in ER or EW, that stands for extended, extended distance. Guess what? That, again, is single mode fiber. That's an easy way to tell if it's going to be uh, multi-mode or single mode fiber. And remember, multi-mode is short distance. Single mode fiber is long distance or extended distance. Now let's go back to twisted pair wiring. Now, your twisted pair of wiring is either going to be unshielded or shielded. So it's going to be UTP, which is unshielded twisted pair, or it's going to be STP, shielded twisted pair. 
STP has an additional metal shield that is either wrapped around all of the pairs or around the individual pairs. That metal shielding or foil reduces the opportunity for electromagnetic interference or crosstalk to occur, but that shielding also makes that cabling uh, a little bit more expensive, relatively more expensive, a little bit more expensive, and harder to deal with. Why is that? Well, because that shielding actually reduces the flexibility of the cable, so it makes it a little bit harder to get that cabling around corners. Unshielded twisted pair, or UTP, is deployed much more often in the network than STP is. Then your cabling can be categorized as either being plenum grade or non-plenum grade twisted pair. Now, building codes often call for plenum grade cable to be run in plenum spaces. Now, a plenum space is an area that is designed to assist in the airflow of buildings for HVAC purposes. If you're in a building that has a drop ceiling, <clears throat> excuse me, those ceilings that use the tiles, more than likely that space is actually a plenum space just above those tiles. It's being used to assist in the airflow of the building. In most of those situations, building codes will call for plenum grade cable. So now you're kind of going, so what does that mean? Well, the, the outer jacket of a plenum cable is either a fire retardant cover or low smoke PVC material. And that means that if there is a fire and it gets into the plenum space, that area that's designed to move air, that then the cable won't burn, or if it does burn, it won't emit smoke. You never want to breathe in the smoke of a burning cable. Uh, kind of not good for your health. You know, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that outer cover also happens to make that cable a little bit less flexible and more expensive. So you only run plenum grade cable when you have to. Now, quite often, plenum grade cable does have a nylon or polymer strand woven into either the cover or within the pairs. Now, that's nylon or polymer strand is used to help take some of the hanging weight of cables. So you can run plenum grade cable vertically, like in an elevator shaft, as long as it has that polymer strand. That polymer or nylon strand, like I said, is used to help take some of the hanging weight of the cable. And what that does is that reduces the opportunity for that cabling to stretch because if you stretch it too far, guess what? You're going to break the, the pairs of wires inside of the cable, and then you're going to lose your connection, and then you're going to be really kind of upset. Now, a twisted pair network cable can either be a straight through cable or a crossover cable. There is a third one, by the way, but you won't get to that until you get into Network Plus. Now, a straight-through cable is a cable in which the wiring scheme is the same on both ends. Now, a straight-through cable is used to connect dissimilar types of equipment together. So you would use a straight-through cable from your computer to a switch. You would use a straight-through cable from a switch to a router. The other type of cable is called a crossover cable. Now, a crossover cable, the pinouts are different, or the wiring scheme is different on both sides of the cable. And it's used to connect similar types of equipment together, like PC to PC. You can connect one PC to another PC, PC and create a very small network, only two nodes, with a crossover cable. Uh, if you're connecting switches together, you should use a crossover cable. Or if you're connecting routers together through an RJ45 connection, you should use a crossover cable. 
Now, when you're transmitting in Ethernet, in most of the standards, you transmit on pins 1 and 2, and you receive on pins 3 and 6. So if you look at that image of the crossover cable, white, orange, orange is the transmit on one end, and white, orange, orange are the receive on the other end. Does that make sense? And on the first end, the end on the left, the receive is white, green, green. Guess what? On the other end of the cable, that would be pins one and two, which would be the transmit. So that's what it does. It kind of cross over, it crosses the communication across so the other side can receive it and understand it. So now let's talk a little bit more about categories of twisted pair wiring. Let's talk about conductor construction. The conductor in twisted pair wiring can be either a solid conductor, that's where the core of each wire is made from a solid copper conductor. Now solid, co solid conductor twisted pair wiring is very strong and sturdy. If you're pulling cabling through walls, um, especially over distance, you want to use solid core twisted pair. It's not very flexible, but it's very sturdy, and you can pull it through walls uh, with confidence that you're not going to stretch it too far and break it. The other type of conductor that you could have is, strand, is the stranded conductor. The core of each wire is made from a, from, made from small, thin strands of copper that are twisted together. Now, it's not as strong as, or as sturdy as solid core, but it's much more flexible. Uh, you can coil it up, you can twist it around, it works great. It's, it's the one that we use most often. And it's great for connecting from patch panels to equipment. And that's where you'll probably see it the most. Now, twisted pair network cables are broken out into categories based on their maximum rated ability to handle network traffic. Now, most of that rated traffic or the bandwidth gains in the wires is actually due to changes in the twist rates. The more twists that are in a pair of wires, it reduces uh, the opportunities for EMI and for crosstalk, and that allows for more speed. But the more twists that are in a pair of wires means that you also need more wire to span the same distance. There are currently five different categories of twisted pair wiring, and they range from CAT3 all the way through CAT6A. Six, uh, six and unless I tell you otherwise, the maximum distance that any single segment can span and still be able to communicate in an Ethernet network is 100 meters. So let's talk about those speeds and whatnot that you can achieve. And we start with CAT3. It's rated for up to 10 megabits per second, and it was used for 10 base T networking. That's 10 megabits per second baseband over twisted pair wiring. And why do I bring up CAT3? Well, because we still use CAT3 today. Particularly, we use it when we're wiring for telephone networks. It works, it still works really well for telephone networks, but you probably don't want it in your Ethernet network. Then we have CAT5. Now it's rated up for 100 megabits per second in speed, and we use it for 100 base T networking. Well, that didn't quite keep up with what we're doing in today's networking, so we came up with CAT5e. It's rated for up to 100 gigabits per second. That's 1,000 base T, and we are still using that today. CAT5e has been around for a while, 
and it's a good thing. One of the things that I will say about uh, Cat 5e, remember the, where I said that pins 1 and 3, or excuse me, 1 and 2 were used to transmit, and 3 and 6 were used to receive, so you were only using 2 out of the 4 pair of wiring in most applications. Well, in Cat 5e, what we actually did is we're using all eight pairs of wires. That's how they got it up to one gigabits per second. But that still wasn't fast enough for us. So along comes CAT6. Now CAT6 is rated for up to 10 gigabits per second. So that would be 10 GBE or 10 gigabit Ethernet. And this one has the caveat. If you want that 10 gigabits per second networking, you can only span a maximum distance of 55 meters. You go any further than that, and your speed is going to drop. Well, they wanted to get that full 100 meters worth of length, so they came up with CAT6A. Now, CAT6A is rated for up to 10 gigabits per second networking. And you can have that 100 meter distance span. Well, thank you for watching tonight's webinar. That covers all of the material that you need to know for the CompTIA A plus exam 220-801 objectives 2.1 and 2.2.